I'm Nate Mortimer. Um, I am the uh, leader of the WASP project, um, and this is based on research coming out of my lab. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background today into um, what the research is and kind of how, how GEP meshes with uh, the work in my lab. Um, one note is my lab is actually moving this summer um, to Oregon State University, where I'll be in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll obviously be continuing the project in, in the new location, um, and I'll have some more information about that to come. In my lab, we're primarily interested in understanding host parasite interactions. Um, and this kind of takes a couple of different flavors, right? So if we think about sort of any organism going about its day-to-day -day business, um, it's going to encounter potential pathogens and parasites. And some proportion of those will be able to infect you or whatever organism, right? And then following infection, um, the organism is going to mount some type of immune response to try to eliminate that invader. And so we're interested in understanding immune mechanisms of pathogen defense. Um, and then from the parasites perspective, they're trying to get around that. And, and so these parasites use virulence factors to try to block the host immunity to let their offspring develop. Um, and so we're also interested in, in looking at this perspective of how do parasites manipulate host signaling. Um, and it's this aspect of manipulating host signaling that we are particularly interested in um, in context of the GEP project. And that's also kind of the, the main funding for my lab. So it's, it's my sort of primary interest as well. The system that we use is a Drosophila parasitoid wasp system. And so Drosophila, you're all well aware by now, I think, are, are fruit flies. And we use several species of Drosophila in the lab. And Drosophila get infected by um, a group of, of wasps that we call parasitoid wasps. So these are Hymenoptera, you know, very small. When you think of a wasp, you think of yellow jacket. These are more ant size, so a little bit less intimidating for students to work with. But they are obligate parasites of Drosophila species. And so what they do is they infect the fly larva using their ovipositor. And during infection, they're actually transferring their egg into the host and also what we call the venom. Um, and it's the venom that's really the focus of this GEP project. And so the wasp use these venom proteins to manipulate their host, right? So it changes the host physiology, metabolism is changed, development is changed, um, and they can also go in and block immune signaling. Um, and they do this by targeting conserved signaling pathways. Um, and so really what we're interested in is understanding, well, first identifying and then, and then understanding how these venom proteins are able to target these conserved signaling pathways. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the, the physiology of, of the wasp itself. Um, and so these wasps, like I said, are, are small hymenoptera, um, and they have specialized organs for doing this um, infection and making the venom and passing on the venom. Um, and so what you're looking at on the screen now is a fluorescent image of a um, wasp venom apparatus. Um, it's been stained with phylloidin, so we're just showing the, the filamentous act in here. Um, and what I want to do is just kind of walk you through the process of being a venom protein and how it gets from DNA to, to host. Um, so we have at the left here is a gland that we call the venom gland. These are not very original names, um, but the venom gland is a gland um, in which the cells are transcribing um, the venom encoding genes and then translating them into proteins. Um, these proteins are secreted from these venom gland cells. And then they travel down this little duct here into the venom reservoir. And the venom reservoir is a great huge, essentially sac um, that as you can see is surrounded by striated muscle. And so all of the venom as the wasp produces it gets passed into this reservoir and that's where it's stored. Now the reservoir lays just next to um, what we call the ovarian cavity. And this is um, an anatomical structure that's connected to the ovary. Um, and it's roughly the size of one wasp egg. So you can kind of see this outline here. So this is a wasp egg um, in the cavity. So this you know, wasp kind of has one in the chamber. Um, and you, we're a little bit out of the focal plane, but you can kind of see how this ovarian cavity is also surrounded by muscle. Um, both the ovarian cavity and the venom reservoir um, meet at the, at the um, posterior end and they connect to the ovipositor. Um, so this is sort of the proximal end of the ovipositor. Um, for scale, the distal end would be a few more screens up 
Um, so the ovipositor is quite a big structure compared to everything else we're looking at. Um, and this ovipositor has neurons along it, um, sensory neurons. And so when the ovipositor is inserted into a host, it triggers signaling in these neurons. Um, action potentials run up the ovipositor and that causes contraction of the muscles that surround the venom reservoir and the ovarian cavity to essentially squeeze off the venom and the egg, pass down the ovipositor into the host. And so that's how infection happens. Um, and because this is a nicely contained structure, um, these are, when you get used to it, quite easy to dissect. Um, and so what we've been able to do is dissect out venom reservoirs and extract the pure venom directly from the reservoir. And so we've been able to do mass spectrometry on them to identify all of the proteins that are found in a venom reservoir. And so we've been able to identify these venom components. Um, it's mostly protein. Um, there are some lipid enclosed structures um, as well that we're kind of characterizing now. Um, we've looked at three wasp species so far, um, and they have an average of about 150 <laughs> venom proteins. So these are quite complex mixes of, of proteins. Um, that do all of the downstream functions. And so really this part of my lab is, is focused on um, looking at how these venom proteins are manipulating host signaling. Um, we look at it kind of in the general context of um, you know, infection and disease and immune mechanisms, um, but we're also kind of interested in looking at disease models. Um, and we've actually identified wasp venoms that alter a lot of fly models of human disease. So inflammatory diseases, cancers. Um, and so we're kind of very interested in, in trying to understand how venom proteins are able to, to manipulate their hosts um, in, in all of these different contexts. Um, I'll tell, kind of tell you a little bit about one of the ongoing projects. Um, so we've identified about 30 gene families that have um, members in, that have been found from venom from each of the three species of wasps that we've looked at. Um, and the three species of wasps that we looked at are quite diverged from each other. So two are um, from a single genus, and then one is, is very much an outgroup. Um, but all three of them share, you know, proteins that come from these, this core set of gene families. Um, and so the current GEP project is to have students annotate all of the venom and non-venom encoding genes um, from these 30 gene families across the three species. Um, and so, you know, kind of like Laura was saying, this leads to a lot of really good ways of setting up your classroom. Um, so you could have students, you know, I, I do something similar where the students work in groups and each student gets a gene from um, a different species. And so they have to annotate their gene and then compare it with the others. Um, we also have a lot of um, genes where there are sort of venom paralogs and non-venom paralogs. And that also makes for a really good um, project where the students will annotate venom and non-venom and then actually look for differences between them um, that might be indicative of evolution happening faster in the venom, which is kind of our underlying hypothesis. Um, and so along with looking at these kind of evolutionary aspects, um, the gene annotation is also really nice in that it helps guide our wet lab research. Um, and so, you know, the wasp that we're looking at, we don't really have a good reference genome. And so whenever we want to do experiments with these wasps where we are, you know, going to clone the gene um, and then express it in the lab and test its function, um, it really helps to have the complete gene model. And so that's kind of what the students in GEP are contributing to. Um, I'll actually talk in a few minutes about um, one of those particular projects that we're doing. Uh, but really by having these, you know, good gene models, we, we can do a lot of wet lab research um, that, that's kind of difficult to do otherwise. And so I'm sure you've seen the genome browser a lot, so I'll just show it to you quickly. Um, and I want to kind of highlight a little bit about this project. Um, so each of our three wasp species, of course, has its own browser. Um, and for each species, we have, of course, the genome data. Um, we have, you know, RNA-seq, so the RNA-seq data is overlaid, um, gene predictors, all of the things you're kind of used to seeing, um, but also because we have this mass spec data that we've gotten from the protein, we have a peptide track. Um, and so in the view here, this is kind of what's along the top here, where each one of these little features represents a peptide from the mass spec. 
Um, and so the students can go through and determine, you know, whether uh, a protein encoded by a, a gene is in the venom or not based on these peptides. Um, we have instances where there are genes with multiple isoforms, and one of the isoforms specifically is found in venom. And so you can look across the mutually exclusive exons for um, venom peptides um, and kind of come up with hypotheses about whether a given gene is, or a given isoform is venom specific or, or, or not. Um, and so it kind of leads to some interesting things for the students to think about, um, and particularly kind of ties the genome browser, which is very sort of DNA based into thinking about the proteins that actually get encoded, um, which I think is kind of a, a useful thing that is not an intuitive leap for all of the students. And so I think seeing this, this evidence on there is kind of nice. Um, and then of course the students are building models of the genes like, like you're learning how to do now. Um, and as I said, we use those both for sort of evolutionary analysis and then also in, in, in the lab to do some experiments. Um, oops, I, okay. So I've kind of touched on a lot of these already, but I kind of wanted to go through a little bit more explicitly some of the goals of the project. Um, and so we have these two, these two aspects that kind of live next to each other, right? So we're interested in the evolution of venom encoding genes. And then we're also interested in understanding the function of their proteins. Um, and genome or gene annotation is really important for both of these um, by getting the sequences that, that we need to do it. Um, I'm also hoping to get students more and more involved in, in both of these downstream aspects. Um, and I'll touch on that again in, in just a second here. Um, but when we kind of get below these big umbrella terms and think about what we're actually looking at in the data, um, I just kind of want to bring up a few things that, that students in, in my classes do and that students in, in other classes working on this project are doing. Um, so things like looking for venom-specific isoforms or paralogs. Um, there are about 20% of the venom genes we've identified so far don't have homology to anything in the NCBI database. Um, and so we have this idea that they're potentially de novo venom gene, or de novo genes, or, or evolving so quickly that um, they don't have enough homology to, to anything. And so we're interested in, in looking at those um, also. Um, we're interested in trying to identify motifs in the genome and within the transcript sequence that might be useful to identify a given gene as a venom gene, um, and also to try to understand how um, it's transcriptionally regulated. Um, perhaps we can find some transcription factor binding sites, that kind of thing. Um, we're also interested in using the sequences the students produce to identify functional domains. Um, and so, you know, we have students running um, different predictor programs to try to make hypotheses about what the venom proteins may be doing. Um, and then, of course, you know, over the last couple of years with all of the advances in um, predicting structures, um, I've had my students using, using some of these new tools to be predicting the structure of the, the venom proteins, um, which gets really exciting when, when um, the sequence is, is very far evolved from, from the non-venom version. Um, and looking to see how that can affect the structure um, is, is really kind of interesting. Um, so just give a couple of, this is obviously an adapted slide from, from a different talk, um, but just a couple of things to make you aware of. Um, so the um, WASP project has, has its own page on the GEP website and the URL is here. Um, and a couple of the um, faculty that I work with on this project have done a great job in completely revamping the curriculum. Um, so we now have um, lots of different versions of the WASP curriculum that are accessible to students at different levels. Um, and so that's all now available on the website. So that's a relatively new, um, a new feature. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then a few stats on the project. Um, so in this past academic year, there are about 150 genes claimed. Um, and in the, I think four or five years now we've been doing this, we've had about 650 claimed in total. Um, after we've moved, I'm going to sit down and see how many I have complete data for, um, but the last time I checked, it was over 400, so we're, we're producing a lot of data um, for the project. Um, in total, there have been 27 um, different faculty members involved in this project, including six new ones in the last year, um, so we're really excited to see some, some growth of the project. Um, and then I mentioned, um, kind of alluded to, and I'll, and I'll mention briefly now, 
Um, we're also interested in developing some wet lab tie-ins for this research. Um, and like everything in GEP, this is kind of driven by the members. Um, and so I've been working with a couple of, of really great and really motivated people who want to um, use this project for the wet lab portion of their classes as well. Um, and so several of us have been um, working on sort of cloning and expressing and then looking at the activity of venom proteins. Um, also people looking at expression of these venom genes. Um, and my lab right now are collaborating with the Drosophila Genomics Resource Center to develop some um, in vitro immune assays. And I think in the future, those would be really good um, in the classroom to test the um, effects of the venom on, on immune processes, um, which is I think one of the, the more exciting parts of, of what we're doing here. Um, and so of course I need to, to acknowledge that the work in my lab that kind of underlies um, this project um, has fund, been funded by a couple of grants um, from a couple of NIH institutes. Um, there's the URL for the project on the GEP website. Um, I'm sure you're also learning all about Trello this week. Um, and so there is a Trello board um, for this project that has you know, slides from previous talks that I've given and videos of those talks. Um, it has background information. It has some references for students for papers that might be good to read with your students. Um, it links to all the tools as well. Um, and so if you're interested in the project, please join that board. Um, I use that to send out email announcements. Um, I don't think I've sent one in a couple of years, so it's not a spam source, hopefully. Um, but for instance, you know, when I get uh, my email address activated in my, in my new institution, um, I'll use that board to send out my new contact details to people. Um, so if you're interested in this project, um, please go ahead and join that board and then get in touch with me um, for the next couple of weeks at the email that's listed here. Um, and then once I've moved middle of August, it'll be um, a new email address that I'll, that I'll send out through the board once I'm settled in.